We're going. Okay. All right, everybody. Sorry for that little delay. Macintoshes can be a pain in the butt as far as actually using the jet, depending on which equipment it is. Anyway, my name is Aiden Crenshaw, and this talk is on dropping docs on DocNet, how people got caught. Uh, how many people have actually used Tor before? Let me get a feel. All right, I'm going to try to quickly go through that because I only have 40 minutes for this talk, so uh, I don't know how much we'll get through, but we'll see what we can do. My name is David Kuncher, and uh, I'm on geek.com. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know anything. This is geek time on my hands. I'm going to get turned on. If I do, please correct me. Also, I'm a senior information security consultant at TrustedSec, and I'm also co-founder of Derby Hot. All right, I'm gonna, this talk I'm going to be giving is coming from two different perspectives. There's certain people I'd like to stay anonymous, and there's certain people I'd like to be anonymized. But I, more than anything, I had to find it intellectually interesting to figure out how people can stay anonymous and how they get the anonymized. To me, it's more like a chess game and it's an intellectual curiosity. So I'm not really supposed to take sides on this. Um, and true, truth, truth, personally, I'm not a huge privacy person. I'm kind of one of those guys that likes to know everything. I'm geeky like that. But um, I find the topic of documents really interesting. Also, I'm not a lawyer. Some of the things I'm going to be talking about, um, if you did them yourselves, might break various wiretapping laws, so don't do them. If you did them yourselves, I believe I have it, so I can't be a lawyer. So, you know, any legal advice I give you is not legal advice in the sense of legal advice. So, also, we can avoid you, sir. There's certain, most people I think on these dark nets are um, crypto networking means like I am, but, um, there's also some, you know, less than savory people like um, some pedophiles, some drug dealers, some university administrators, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding, some university administrators, they couldn't figure it out, it's alright. Alright, the basic how Tor works, I'm going to go through this real quick, and I hate to do this to somebody, but anybody can bring me a glass of water, because I'm going to get, oh, <laughs> thank you, I'm going to get dry before too long. A uh, little bit back on our Tor, now we talked about dog pants in the previous talk, and those types of dog nets, there's, um, uh, there's two ways to dog net the term is used in information security. One is a piece of set aside IP space which no, no one's supposed to be going to. So if anybody does touch it, you know they have to be malicious because there's no legitimate reason for touching it. Another term for dog net, or another way that dog is used is a uh, private anonymizing network. A, a network that you can't necessarily see who's talking to who. So it's dog in that sense. Um, personally, I like the term cyberspace better because it's more clear. Essentially, it's just a network of where encryption is used a lot, so you can't tell who's talking to who. You add levels of the privacy and anonymity. Um, but most of these documents function by a series of proxies that one person doesn't necessarily know who they're talking to next. I mean, if you miss getting encrypted into you, you should pass it to someone else, but since it's encrypted as it passes through you, and you only have your keys for encrypting it, your layer of it, you can't see everything. There's different types of documents out there, but the, the biggest one, the 800 pound gorilla, is Tor. And this was started as a Navy research project back in the day. Now it's a 5013C, after the EFF had it for a little while. And essentially it's out there to provide a privacy for those who want it. The way it works is you basically have several proxies that you are, well, I think the next slide will explain that better. But it essentially allows you to access the public internet semi-privately, as well as access to some hidden services. So you can actually host something like a website, uh, a boxing SSH to an FTP site, thank you very much. Any of those sorts of things, and not have people know who's necessarily hosting it. And the way this is all done is via socks boxing on a local machine. At least that's the way you access services. Uh, here's basically how the onion router works. You have three hops, it's layered encryption, you have bi-directional tunnels, as in the traffic going out through your one tunnel comes back the same tunnel. There's other systems like I2P, where your ins and your outs are different, which can confuse the living hell out of a traffic analysis attacks. Also, it has directory service, which is kind of a central point that could cause failure. We'll talk about that in a bit. And uh, it's mostly focused on proxying to the public internet, at least until recently. I don't a lot more news about uh, hidden services on board. 
But Tor isn't like an ogre, it has layers. Essentially, whenever you want to send down a Tor, by default you have three hops. You encrypt it with three levels of encryption. You have the public key for this guy, this guy, and this guy. And you encrypt it with each layer. And as it hops from one proxy to the next, it gets a layer stripped off and passed on to the next proxy. So the idea is, this guy right here, he can see what you're sending out on the public internet, but he doesn't know who it came from. He only knows he got in here. This guy doesn't know what you're actually sending to eventually, all that data is still encrypted, but he doesn't know who you are either because there's another level of crossing. And here, this guy gets it when it's wrapped up three levels of encryption, and only in two of those levels, he can't even read through it. So that's the basic amount of tool works as far as outcrossing <coughs> the public internet. But it's also known about hidden services. Hidden services allow you to host something inside the Tor, well, let's say cloud, and not have it easily tied back to you. Uh, what happens is, let's say Bob wants to um, put something out there like polyester road, that uh, he wants to sell like on a 70s discount clothing through on a black market. So Bob will create this little hidden service, and he'll set up a bunch of introductory points, and then advertise those in database. I've those that advertise, let's say Alice wants to find some polyester clothing. They'll go ahead and find in the DB, well, they'll, they'll find out about this um, polyester road and create a DB and find introductory points and they'll make their own rendezvous point. They will coordinate through the introductory points the ability for them to actually exchange information, use the rendezvous point, and eventually set up a tunnel so they can start exchanging information back and forth. When it comes to Tor, there's all sorts of different node types, and this is just terminology in case you're ever reading a news story that, that talks about it. You have just a general client, it's just the user of Tor, they're not necessarily hosting anything. Those relays, a piece of people are basically uh, pushing traffic through themselves, uh, but just because you're a relay doesn't mean you're an exit point. Being an exit point is where it gets a little legally trickier. In the United States, you're generally uh, okay, um, sort of, um, State law laws protect you. In Austria, there was a guy who recently got in trouble because he had an exit point and someone was using it for illicit uh, things. But relay is basically cache <coughs> traffic. A bridge is a type of relay that is an entry point, but it's not advertised in the directory. The reason they do this is the directory is queryable. You can figure out whether or not a particular um, point is in the directory. And what places like China would do would be, oh, let's find out everybody in the directory, let's ban them all. By using bridges, None of those um, entry nodes are in one place. So if you use a bridge, they don't necessarily know that you're talking to Tor, or they don't necessarily know to block it. There's ways you can do traffic analysis to know it's Tor, and that's not using, or not as proxy obfuscation is being built into um, Tor. That's a little bit of a different subject. Those guard nodes, which are more trusted nodes for your first hop in Tor, the idea being is if someone's your first hop, and they're your last hop, they can figure out who you are by seeing how much traffic's being sent and when it's being sent. And I'll explain that a bit also. Those introductory points, which I showed in the previous um, slides about setting up something in a hidden service, and rendezvous points, all used for setting up hidden services. Since you were using Tor, uh, well, this is a little bit older school version of it, generally you want to be using the Tor browser. It's been harder in multiple ways to keep, you can configure Tor yourself in your own browser, but I wouldn't recommend it. There's all sorts of ways where you can misconfigure it and keep yourself be anonymized. But essentially, you just use a web browser to access the things you want to access. It gets a little bit more complex if you're doing things up in the web server. Like, you can do SSH over Tor if you really want to. All sorts of applications out there. A part of the one I want to about is Tails, the amnesiac incognito live system. Uh, basically, it's a boot DVD where you can run a Tor from it. You can also run I2P from it. And uh, after you shut down the machine, everything was in memory, you give it a little bit of time, and it's all gone. The sun called it, they made it in cold boot tech. Basically, you give the machine fast enough, grab its memory, keep it cold, shove it into another machine, suck all the memory out of it, you can find what the person was looking at. But generally, that time frame is very, very short. So, you know, if someone, if you took your laptop, turned it off, and did this with the cops for like a minute, you could probably get away. But you look silly doing it. There's a Tor web proxy, which is basically if you want to web server around Tor's like hidden services, but don't want to start a Tor, you can do it. Your key mine will be anonymous. The hidden wiki, which you can find a bunch of other Tor sites through. Scallion, which is for making those, um, well, for instance, that's polyester road. I just thought it was right. Silk road. You may notice if you've seen its URL, it starts off with silk road and the rest is, you know, random looking. Scallion is basically a way, it's kind of like how you um, 
brute force or password hash, it allows you to brute force those names. You can have a name that's semi-representative of whatever service you want to run. That's how they generate that self road in the URL. Uh, Onion Cats for passing various data across Tor networks. And if you want to learn more about Tor, check out the Reddit page, Onions. A Tor has some pros and cons. If you can tell it with stock spotty, generally you can get it to go over Tor. That's nice. And those three levels of encryption, it's um, fairly anonymous depending on who the adversary is. Uh, however, there is some downside. It's slow. No, quite frankly, uh, hidden services are way faster now than they used to be a few years ago. And you can never be as fast as the public internet because, well, you have to go through extra boxes to get anywhere. And it also has a semi fixed infrastructure, for instance, back in 2009, the great firewall trying to block 80% of the Tor relays listed in the directory, so that it awfully hard to get on unless you knew the bridges. And that's the whole purpose of the bridges being out there. Where you got the bridges in the past, they keep changing the protocol for this. So it was like a website you go to, and you'd like a few at a time, and then it was an email address you email, and they email you back, different entry points. It's also fairly easy to tell someone is using it in the service side. I actually have a code post on my website um, about how to detect whether or not someone who's visiting you is um, coming from Tor. Actually, if you visit my website over Tor, you'll notice that there's a little different icon in the top left hand corner instead of the buff penguin. It's like a little onion. And what does it look like traffic wise? Well, generally, locally, you're going to have uh, port 950, 950 open with Tor Sox Proxy. Uh, it's different on an old oh, control port 9051. Uh, now, if you're using the Tor browser bundle, it's going to be 9150 and 9151, respectively. That's so you can have the Tor browser bundle running at the same time as a normal Tor install. Uh, remotely, most of the traffic is going to look like an HTTPS unless you pack an analysis on it. And there's also some work being done on obfuscating the um, traffic to make it look like other types of traffic, like HTTP, Skype, and I think there's a few other ones. Oh, quick shout out to I2P. I'm not covering I2P in this talk. It's another darknet project that I'm a fan of. Uh, give it a uh, shot if you want to play around with it. It's got some interesting, uh, well, they call it e-site, so it's a website. They also have hidden services functionality. That was its like, core focus. Also, just a quick word about Bitcoin. It's a cryptocurrency. It uses proof of work algorithms to decide uh, to basically uh, account for value. Uh, give you an idea what a proof of work algorithm is. Back in the day, back in the late 90s, when spam was an even bigger problem than it is now. So I put up the idea of hash cash, where, well, if you just send me an email, you have to prove you all go by saying, do some kind of work for me. Uh, for instance, well, I'll give you an example of proof of work. Uh, I say, you figure out what my password is, here's my hash. It's, it's like a full character password. It's going to take a while, it's not going to take too long to hash that. Let's say it takes a second. Well, one second isn't that much for them to do with a legitimate email, but a spammer, one second for each email greatly slows down their ability to spam thousands and thousands of people. That's an example of a proof of work algorithm. Not the one that Bitcoin actually uses, but um, it's an idea of what a proof of work, con uh, proof of work algorithm is. They also uh, have tumblers where when people are exchanging Bitcoins, they can send it into a Tumblr, have a mixed match of other people's Bitcoins, then eventually send out to whoever it actually needs to be sent out to, to confuse, well, money trails, essentially. Uh, Bob Weiss gives a great talk on this. I recorded him last year at uh, B-Sides Delaware, so I recommend you check that out. By the way, these slides are away from my website someplace, and if you buy it once, then I can get into it. But yeah, check out his talk. Okay, that actually brings me to the case 14 minutes in, so let's see if I'm going to use, like, an extra cook through it the time remaining. So, back on December 16, 2013, a bomb was made to Harvard student newspaper and some of the officials. Since you just read this, travel bombs placed in Science Center, Server Hall, uh, Emerson Hall, Fair Hall, 234, guess correctly, be quick or they go off soon. Well, the person who used GorillaMail.com sends a particular email message. And they also were using it doing it over tour. Now, the reason they were doing it over tour is whenever you're using the mail, it puts in an X originating IP header. And they can quickly look at the IP address and figure out whether or not it's tour by querying for its directory. Well, all the tour nodes are known. If you go to that particular website, you can actually see the list of um, tour nodes. Well, not all tour nodes, the bridges aren't necessarily known. But they can tell the exit points. And they can tell this was a Tor person. So it was fairly easy to correlate who was attached to the Harvard network at the time and who was 
connected to the tour at the same time. If they didn't use the bridge, it would have been easy, but they didn't apparently use the bridge. So they found this guy named Elbow Kim. Apparently he was using Tor at the exact same time as the email was sent. And I don't know if he was the only person using it or not, but anyway, they decided to talk to him. And uh, apparently he confessed when they came to talk to him and he wanted to get out of the final. And that's why he made bombs right there. There was no actual bombs. Uh, so he kind of screwed up his academic career and his career in general, the life in general, by making this threat. There's a lot of information out there on Ars Technica and um, there's some uh, court documents out there on Scribe D. So, a few lessons learned where the elder kids can screw up. First of all, don't be the only person using Tor on a modern network at a given time. <laughs> that will be a bad thing for you. Uh, use a bridge. That would help. They used the bridge. Now, there's ways you can do protocol analysis to figure out the still Tor traffic. I uh, somehow doubt that Hawk was going that in depth on all the packets. Uh, don't admit anything. We don't know for sure that he was the only person using Tor at that time. And it's possible that uh, other people were using Tor. It's hard to be a university. You know, sure they have some like computer security departments or privacy departments that would be interested in using Tor. So I kind of believe he was the only guy using Tor at that particular time. So if he hadn't admitted to it, he may have got away with it. And also, correlation attacks are a bitch. And we'll explain correlation attacks here. Where correlation attack works is, let's say all the data is encrypted, but um, you can't read it. You can, read, you can tell things about it, like size and timing. So let's say a particular node sends it out a five meg request to somebody, and I have two evil nodes, my entry node here and my other X node here. And you can tell they're evil because they have little goatees. <laughs> You're Star Trek fans, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, you see five megs go through. You see five megs, and it's all encrypted. This guy sees five megs, and it's all encrypted. This guy sees eight megs come back. Wait a second. And this guy sees eight megs come back. And because of the timing and the sizes, they go, huh, this is part of the same person talking. That's the reason for those entry nodes I mentioned before. The person having very trusted entry nodes is you want to make sure that the person in your, um, you want to make sure that your adversary isn't both the entry point and the exit point, or it can be fairly easy to be anonymized. Also, those timing correlation attacks, uh, they can just watch the timing of the packets coming through and seeing who's sitting in traffic when. Uh, they can also try to DOS uh, a host and see whether or not it causes an effect. If you have a suspect, suspicion that a big IP address on the internet actually hosts a Tor hidden service, you can try DOSing that website and then see if the Tor hidden service goes away. You can also try to pulse pulse data yourself uh, as it flows through you and see if you can uh, track the traffic someplace place down the line. Um, or you can even change the load on the path and see if you can pulse the traffic that way. Like you call it the nano service, the one that knows you know what's hopping through. Uh, I think there was a project I think called a Maginal. Mag I don't want to keep saying Maginal line, that's a French fireball company. Uh, it's a Maginal. What's a force hammer? Morgineer. Anyway, there was, there was like, I think it was an NSA project to do something similar to this. At least from the documentation I read, it sounds like something similar to what I'm talking about here. I mean, I mentioned why the Tor browser model is important, and sometimes it's hard to configure things properly yourself in Tor. Let's say you want to use Internet Explorer, but you forget to set up the proxy so that it forwards DNS entries to the proxy. Like, for instance, let's say Firefox. By default, you need to set up a proxy, it does DNS using your local IP settings. The problem with that is, let's say you're going to the polyester road. Well, they didn't have secret traffic, you're sitting in the polyester road, your DNS service will see that you're querying the name you know, polyester road some squiggies dot onion. And that would be bad for anonymity. Case number one, by the way, I'm counting these in like a program shirt from case zero to case whatever. Molsec. This is a Hector Xavier Monsignor. Monsignor? I don't know, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Anyway, so dude, he normally used Tor for connecting to IO City, but was caught not using it one time and the FBI landed on it. Since he got caught, he decided to start collaborating. Now, Hector was speaking to a guy named Jeremy Cameron, though we didn't know that at the time, who was going by the handle SubG amongst other handles. And on IRC, Jeremy Cash let things slip about like where he was arrested and groups he had been involved with. They figured out what time zone he was in, they figured out he was in the Midwest. 
And there were so many people who fit the particular um, specifics of him. You know, some of the people who had a record and that particular skill set. So they started thinking maybe it was Jeremy Hammond. So they nailed down suspects for a whole lot because of the things he said online. Well, Hammond used Tor consistently. And while the crypto tour was never busted, the FBI had Sabu talk to Sub G online, and they were able to correlate when Sub G was online and when Hammond was online because they apparently uh, got permission to tap his internet access. And there's a lot more information on the Ars Technical article on how they busted him, but it basically came down to him revealing too much information about himself online and then doing the correlation tag. So, lessons learned from Lulsec. One, use Tor consistently. If Sabu had used Tor every single time he ever connected to IRC, uh, he wouldn't necessarily got caught by the FBI. Uh, don't give out personal information. If Sub G hadn't given out a bunch of information like, oh yeah, I was arrested here, or I was involved in this particular political rally here, uh, he may not have got caught, or they may not have started looking closer. The correlation tax is still a bitch. And we'll get to the next one in a second. I do want to go back to the IRC thing for just a second and using it consistently. There was a group of uh, great, this is back when I was doing various arts. Um, a guy named Ryan Cleary was part of a particular anonymous movement. By the way, anonymous is not one single group. If anybody thinks they are, they're not. Anonymous is a whole collection of people. Just, anonymous is not a group, it's a meme. Essentially, the way it works is someone on a forum, somebody says, hey, wouldn't it be funny or you know, politically motivated if we go do this to these particular people. And when people agree, they go do it. But there's no central organization to it. Um, well, this guy named Ryan Clay was involved with various arts. He got pissed off with the rest of the group. He controlled the IRC service. So that, despite the fact people were cloaking their IP addresses from each other, uh, but through various options, since he ran the IRC service, he knew their IP addresses, and he decided to dump them all. Why these people decide to use um, Public IP addresses on IRC, I don't know, especially since I2P offers IRC capability built in and you would be anonymous from each other. I don't know. But that's how uh, some people got anonymized and anonymous a while back. All right, freedom hosting is another case example I want to give. Freedom hosting hosted, among other things, child porn and uh, other kid related services, kid services related websites. Uh, not everything was child porn, but that just happened to be one of the things they had out there. Uh, also, because of this, they got, well, Anonymous got pissed off at them, and Anonymous started hacking various websites posted on them. So, they got some attention that way. I think Anonymous actually uh, broke into a couple of websites and started dumping uh, the user account list of uh, email addresses and such they had registered for these child porn sites with. Anyway, on July 2013, the FBI compromised freedom hosting and they inserted malicious JavaScript that used Firefox bug CVE 2013-1690 in a version of uh, Firefox 17 extended service release. Now, the basis of Tor browser bundle is Firefox. And actually, by this time, Tor had already fixed it. Tor had already gone out and removed those vulnerability and put out a new browser bundle that had to fix this. However, not everybody updates in a timely fashion. <laughs> so, since they compromised some of these freedom hosting sites, and they knew that there was a version of the Tor browser bundle that was fairly recent that uh, had a vulnerability, they used a payload they created called Magneto, which uh, phoned home to an IP address in Virginia. And it would report back various information about machines that connected to these sites. So MAC address, Windows host name, unique serial number, and it all, used all this to tie it to a particular user. It this may be something similar to the uh, <laughs> NSA's project, or the, what is the, um, I keep forgetting the name of it, uh, Great Britain's version of the NSA. CHQ? <coughs> you see, I think this is even the NSA. What? GCHQ. GCHQ. I think this is a project of one of theirs. Uh, one of those groups, but even this equals draft. I think it uses the same exploit, uh, or should it say the same vulnerability, but um, not exactly the same. I'm not sure how much the FBI and the uh, NSA collaborate on that sort of thing. But there's been a malware in the past that used to be anonymized, people like Josh Lantern, Fox Acid, and uh, Sid have. Oh, thanks to Joe Cisco for telling me about some of those previous ones. You can see one of his talks, uh, he gives a talk about privacy. 
in a surveillance state, evading detection. He gave this at a, a con, or thought con in Chicago here a few months back. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded. So, after they compromised these systems, they started putting two and two together, and they think they knew who it was, so they ended up landing on an Irishman named Eric uh, Marquez, I believe is how you pronounce that. Marquez, maybe. And he's alleged to be the operator of Freedom Hosting. The service uh, hosting, Freedom Hosting was tied to him because of the payment records that he paid on the So, they compromised the box, they found its IP address, they found who's using that box, who paid the records, they figured out who's paying for it, and they tied it to him. Uh, he said to have died from his laptop as soon as the police started raiding him. So, more than likely, he had hard drive encryption enabled, but while still up and running, it's not really the crypt. I will, the keys are in me, it's accessible, the cops have to get to it, uh, use the key jailer to keep it from going to sleep, and get to it really as fast as they can. Uh, more details on this wire article. So, let's take a few lessons from this particular case example. <coughs> Don't host Captain Picard or Julian Bashir. <laughs> okay, the people who laughed at that come from a very strange culture, just to let you know. Uh, in the chain culture, uh, Captain Picard is abbreviated CP, which is child born, Julian Bashir, JB, Jelly. Now you know, and no one's had that. Uh, if they hadn't been doing hosting that, no one would have came after them. They were just hosting sites that involved, you know, Networking in general, and crypto in general, or even political dissident sites, uh, probably the more important would came after. Patch, patch, patch. If the people who uh, got hit by the internet had patched the newest version of Firefox, well, the newest version of Tor Browser Bundle as soon as it came out, they wouldn't have had nearly the problems that they did, since they wouldn't have been susceptible to Magneto. And also, with all the money. If he had paid for the services via some other means, they, if he didn't pay for the servers where he hosted the tour, getting services at, they had some other means other than, you know, direct payment, they may not have caught him. And also, leaving encrypted laptops in a power <coughs> state were not in use. He wouldn't have had a die for it if it was already closed and shut down. In which case, the uh, powers of be would have confiscated the laptop, had an encrypted laptop, and not been able to do a whole lot about it. All right. Make a hidden server contact you over the public internet. Talk a little bit about this. Uh, let's say you may not know whether the actual machine is host because you don't have this real IP address, you just have this Tor hidden service name. However, let's say it's susceptible to some web vulnerability. If you can send an exploit to it, you can maybe get it to contact you outside of the document over its public IP address. And if I have time for a demo, I'm going to show that as well. The next case I'm going to talk about is the Silk Road. Someone going by the name Dread Power Gardens was the operator of Silk Road, which allows sellers and buyers to exchange less than legal services and goods. And um, there's a whole bunch of stuff they offer. Like we go in here, uh, alcohol, apparel, FC, dissociatives, precursors, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think it's what Charlie Sheen would refer to as winning. <laughs> <laughs> but so, do you think you can you want there? <laughs> Okay, I got out. All right. So, there are tons of different things out there. Though some of the things they would allow you to do, like at some point, it seemed like they wouldn't let you exchange currencies that are counterfeit, but other times they would, according to some things that I read. And also, they had the blue line, like, you know, fake degrees and so forth. I'm not sure why the blue line there. Anyway, they started racking up a lot of exchanges, like 1.2 billion worth, so they had to be added to a little bit of interest. So they started to look at the earliest references to Silk Road on the public internet. And guess what they found? They found some guy named Altoy posted on Shroomy a while back. And he essentially said, I came across this website called the Silk Road. It's a tour hidden service that claims to allow you to buy and sell anything online anonymously. I'm thinking of buying from it, but one, see if anyone here had heard of it or recommended it. I found it through, and it gives a word site, oh, sorry, WordPress site, which if you have a Tor browser, directs you to the real site at, and it gives a URL for it. Let me know what you guys think. It's very clear though from where he wrote that, he's not really asking people's opinions on it, he's advertising it. And that was the very first thing they could Then there was this Bitcoin talk, that org post, someone came up later on, and, uh, 
he talked about Austin's bread. Essentially, he's going to and he's advertising it again. Again, I'm using an Altoid. And eventually, he also starts um, asking on a Bitcoin form, looking for an IT pro in the Bitcoin community, and uses the name Altoid again. Remember, Altoid is the first guy that ever seen mentioned so far on the internet. And this time, he says, anybody who can help me with this, contact me at RossOldrick at gmail.com. <laughs> so, yeah, we're pretty sure it's Ross at this point. But it gets worse. I mean, this is a death by a thousand people because when it comes to offset. Um, his Google Plus profile listed um, on the Mises Institute as one of his interests. He had an interest in uh, Washington School of Economics, which so did the uh, Dreaded Power of Roberts. So that ties the two together somewhat. And the signature of Dreaded Power of Roberts had stuff in the Mises Institute. So we knew they had common interests. Also, on Stack Overflow, Ross Goldberg account was created, and he posted some questions about how to uh, write some PHP code that would interact with foreign hidden services. And he quickly realized his mistake and decided to change his name to Frosty, but originally it was Ross Ulbrich. And I guess he's not suspect of the Dread Power Roberts. And that's about the expression I have in my face, too, if they were suspecting me of being involved in a $1.2 billion criminal enterprise. Anyway. Someone was connected to a server that hosted the Silk Road from an internet cafe near where Ross lived in San Francisco. And uh, private messages on Silk Road may have seen the dread part of Ross seem to live in the Pacific time zone. So that sort of tied together. The IP of the Silk Road server was attached to a VPN server that was connected to by an IP belonging to an internet cafe on Laguna Street in San Francisco, from which Ulrich had uh, also connected to his Gmail account with both of those on like June 30, uh, sorry, June 3rd, uh, 2013. I came to Dread Pi Roberts from a user said the site was leaking some sort of external IP address belonging to the VPN. So more than likely, the FBI got brought that in by compromising some kind of security flaw in the code on, on uh, the Silk Road. I'm not quite sure. But once they figure out its public IP address, if it's in a country that you know has um, good relations with the US, then you get a hard guy image. So the FBI starts taking down Silk Road servers. I'm not exactly sure how they got into it. I think it was weird with injections that they hacked one of the sites. But once they located it, they could get a copy of one of the servers and start looking at it more. Another thing happened that um, caused Ross some problems. On 7 10 2013, US Customs intercepted nine IDs with different names, but all having a picture of Ulrich on them. And Home Security interviewed Ulrich. He denied having offered them, ordered them. Um, which, which makes sense, and that's the wise thing to do, deny everything. However, not so smart. What is the smart part? He generally, according to the FBI, open, generally refused to answer any questions pertaining to the purchase of this or other counterfeit identity documents. He was a stupid. However, Goldberg volunteered that hypothetically, anyone could go online to a website named Silk Road on tour and purchase any drugs or fake identity documents that the person wanted. Why did he volunteer that information? That just seems like a dumbass thing to do. The theme of the last two times is some criminals are dumbasses. And uh, the roommate's also name is Josh, and PM showed that Dread Pilot Roberts was uh, interested in buying fake IDs. So, all just kind of let the bad things be Also, one of the servers that was compromised, the SSH keys on it, they ended with Frosty at Frosty. So that ties into the name that Ross Goldberg changed his name to on the uh, website where he was trying to ask for help with his source code. And uh, eventually, on 10-1-2013, the FBI let him on a library right after he entered the passport's laptop, probably in because they suspected it was encrypted. And apparently more evidence was found on his laptop. Big thanks to Nate Anderson for the original article. He wrote a great one for Oz Technica and Agent Christopher Torbell, who uh, wrote the uh, court documents that got a lot of information to go. Lessons learned from him. Keep online identity separate. Keep different usernames in different locations. Uh, if you had access to all different locations on that local coffee shop, that would be one less thing that could tie to him. If you hadn't kept using Altoid every place and Frosty to other places, it wouldn't tie it to him. Like, I had different set of identities on Tor.net than I do on the public internet. Just keep things separate. 
Uh, how did this story when a former home security showed up at his house and his roommates didn't know his real name? That was probably a bad sign. He was up to something. And uh, don't talk about your interests. This goes back to what Jeremy Hammond is included on also. But if his economic interests were you know, the same, that would be one that's going to tie into the uh, very part of Robert's identity. Also, don't volunteer information. Why he mentioned the silk code at all, whatever interview him, I have no clue. So, I hope to do some demos. How much time do I actually have? Five to nine. Five to nine. Uh, I don't have much time to do this, but we'll see what we do. By the way, if you need more links, sites of mine, check out this ADHD project at some point in time for things like web bugs and a revamp of a Metasploit debugger. And let's see, that's very kind of coming up. Now, let's get this in the demos. Uh, I have a few different demos. I'd like to just show them real quick. And I'm talking about de-anonymizing people on the internet. Um, I have a bunch of different ways you can go about doing that, but um, here's Matilda, which is a really, literally vulnerable web server. And the simple commands you can throw at it, let's say you can find a command ingestion vulnerability. I can do all sorts of different things, like I could um, try to have it ping me over the public internet, and let's say I own 8.8.8.8. If I find an ingestion vulnerability that involves Command ingestion, I can sit there, listen to the traffic, and see who's paying me back whenever I use that injection. I'll let that continue. Another thing you could do would be to do like a trace route. And one of the hot, oh yeah, I could just sit there and hopefully I would see the traffic come back. You could do something like a trace route and uh, see what hops. It was going along, and one of those hops would probably be the public IP address for that particular Tor hidden service. Or at least it would give you some information about what ISP they might be using. You could also do a who am I and just find out, oh, the account that's running the other is Avian. That might be another thing. Alright, that's still loading up. Let me see if I can get a time to bring this up and everything. $20. Honey Docs is an interesting little uh, service. Honey Docs allows you to create um, Word docs, Excel sheets, things like that that have hidden trackers in them. So the idea is you send someone to the dark net one of these Word docs for them to open up. And if, not, if they open up on the wrong machine and it doesn't respect the local proxy settings of the power door setup, you can actually trace back the IP addresses of who opened those documents. So the idea is you send a document they might be interested in. And uh, <coughs> track them back. Now, in this case, this is the DEF CON demo I did for the same talk. And you can go into it and actually see where people have opened up the document from. Now, in that case, I think I was on the, um, the network of DEF CON at the time. But it's a great little service that allows you to quickly create quick, quick those docs. I also have some information on my website in the previous version of this talk that shows you how to make it by hand. Um, also, that ADHD product I mentioned. If you go out and you get that DVD, you can, it shows how to uh, do something with um, uh, cascading set style sheets, I think it is, to make it, no, not cascading style sheets, uh, XML uh, definition, to uh, do a similar kind of tracking thing. Okay, this thing timed out, so that didn't actually work out nearly as well as I hoped. Let me see if I have a different one. Oh, one other one, I'll see if I can show real quick. This particular file viewer, I can try to make it show me uh, who the person is and where they're coming from. Basically, by modifying some information, like I can right click on this, inspect element, and this thing has a security vulnerability where you can do remote file includes. So, what I want to do is modify this one to have a different value. And the file I want to have is this. And that's basically a page just returns my public IP address. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to hit view file. And let's see if it returns the right information. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go a lot more demo, but um, yeah. Let's see what's scrolling down. That's part of the public IP address of that hidden service. So despite the fact this is a hidden service, there's still ways you can anonymize it if you can find flaws on the web application. But I think that's about all I have. I only have a minute left anyway. So um, if you have any questions, just see me around the con, and uh, I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you much for your time.
Adrian gives us some good examples of how to get caught, right? <laughs> uh, at this point, we've got a break scheduled. There is coffee and uh, beverages on the back counter in this room.